Thank you very much, Warren, for coming this evening and honoring us. And um, I don't think you need much of an introduction, uh, but I just will say that I think it's fair to say that you are the most respected investor in the world. And I think, uh, the, the most respected businessman in the world, uh, not just because you've made a great deal of money, but because you've done it with enormous integrity and humility, and as people will see tonight, with enormous sense of humor. And in addition to being a business person that everybody would aspire to be, um, he has in recent years become the, with Bill Gates and Melinda Gates, the largest philanthropist in the world. Um, <laughs> I, I think his net worth might be in, a, in excess, a little bit higher than mine, I'd say, uh, uh, about $50 billion more or, ten, more or less, and he's committed to give 99% of that away, uh, and he's in the process of doing so. So thank you on behalf of the country and everybody else for thank doing you. that. I, your background is pretty well known, but some people may not know that you actually spent much of your formative years in Washington, D.C. Your father was elected to uh, the Congress, so you moved here. You went to Alice Deal Junior High School, got a lot of uh, C's and D's, as I understand. <laughs> and then you went to Woodrow Wilson High School, uh, finished uh, 16th in your class, uh, but you were... Class of 17, we might add. Right. <laughs> Well, you had you were working. You were doing. You were pa delivering papers in the morning and delivering yeah. papers in the evening and so forth. And my question, really, to begin, is that many people who grew up in Washington love living here and they want to stay here. So they hope to aspire to be the head of a lobbying firm someday or the head of a congressional staff or something. Um, do you ever have any regrets that you might might have ever make something of yourself had you stayed here? Well, I, I, I'm still young, David. I, okay. I may come back. I All right. Okay. <laughs> I went out to Alice Deal today, first time I'd been there in 65 years, and, and I met the principal. Uh, I went to Wilson also today, but, but at Alice Deal, I tried to get my record expunged, but I had no luck. <laughs> well, um, you told me earlier today that you lived in Spring Valley. Yeah, I lived, I lived at uh, 49th Street between Van Ness and Fordham Road, yeah. And so today, uh, with a camera crew, you knocked on the door of the person who was living in your house. What did that person say? Well, we had a good time. I mean, the house seemed to have shrunk, but uh, yeah. she, she, was, she was very, uh, a wonderful woman. She's lived in the house for 30 plus years, and, and we got along very well. And, and then we retraced my paper up. <laughs> so when you were growing up in Washington, you were already a business person. Well, I thought so. I didn't get a lot of public recognition as such. But <laughs> well, but uh, so you were making money, and as I right. understand it, uh, you filed your first tax return when you were 14 years old. Yeah, it was, for the, it was for the year when I was 13, and 13. I filed it when I was 14, yeah. Okay. And did you think the tax rates were too high then, or why not? It, it hurt more oh, <laughs> in right. those days. I, I did deduct my bicycle and my watch as, as business expenses, and, and only because the statute of limitations is applied. I took them entirely. Apparently, I never used my bicycle for pleasure or my watch. I never okay. looked at my watch except to, when I was delivering papers. <laughs> So um, after you graduated from Woodrow Wilson, you then went to uh, actually the University of Pennsylvania Correct. for a year and a half, and then you transferred back to the University of Nebraska. Why did you leave Penn? That was a great business school. Why did you leave? Yeah, I just, I, I felt I would, I mean, I wanted to quit after one year to be, um, to give okay. you the honest answer on it. My father talked me, he kind of talked me into going to college in the first place, and then he talked me into going a second year, but he said if I went a second year, then I could, I could okay. drop out. And uh, so then I went back to Nebraska. That way I got out of college in three years, and so it, it sped okay. things up. And I planned to live in Nebraska. So when you graduated from the University of Nebraska, you applied to Harvard Business School and were rejected. That's true. Um, yeah. Has Harvard ever announced that they've regretted that decision? Well, the, the, <laughs> I, I understand the development officer is kind of right. unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> So you rejected by Harvard, you went to Columbia Business to Columbia. School, and then you met the man who you really idolized, Ben yeah. Graham. And when you took his class, was he as great as you had thought he was going he, to be? He, he really was. He only, he only taught one semester, one class. I mean, he came up from Wall Street and taught this class. Uh, that's the reason I went to Columbia. And uh, it, he, 
I knew what he, I knew, I'd already read all the books and everything, so I, but it was inspirational just to be around him, and, and I, I, it, it made a real difference in my life. So when you um, graduated, you wanted to go work for him and uh, in his firm, and then he rejected you uh, for an interesting reason. Uh, in those days, I understand that there were Jewish firms and non-Jewish firms, and his was a Jewish firm, and you weren't Jewish, so he said because you weren't Jewish, he didn't hire you. Is that, that right? That's true. He's, and and I, I was ready to convert, believe me. I, <laughs> I, I, I think they might have felt it was a little phony at the time. So I, uh, but it was, it, it was true that uh, there were very few firms in Wall Street that would hire Jews at that time. And Ben only employed five or six people. But he told me to the extent that they had were able to employ five or six people. He really felt that the Jews could not get into most jobs in Wall Street and that they, they were going to employ only Jews. Well, his name was Ben Graham, but actually his real name was? Ben Grossbaum. Well, right. his, 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 yeah, his, his parents I right, think they changed, changed his their name. name. Yeah, my, my son is named Howard Graham Buffett, named after Ben, and, and he's very glad that Ben's Buffett changed his name. <laughs> <laughs> so you moved back for a while to um, uh, Nebraska, but then he ultimately changed his mind and you went to work for Ben Graham. I kept pestering him, yeah. I, I made a real pest of myself. <laughs> and in those years, um, what did you aspire to do? What, did you aspire to become a very wealthy person? Would you want to be buying uh, stocks? Would you want to buy companies? What was your aspiration in those early days? I, I, loved, I loved just analyzing securities. I just spent hours and hours and hours. Just I, I kept turning the pages of Moody's, which instead of going, you know, you had no internet then or anything else, so you had two sources of information, Moody's and Standard and Poor's. And, and we happened to have these sets of Moody's. They were about, in aggregate, probably about 8,000 pages, uh, about five different manuals. And I went through those page by page. And, well, that must have been exciting. Uh. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a little strange. I mean, you know, I, I, I actually went to Amazon a few years ago, and I found an old 1951 Moody's. Now, everybody else is going there for Playboy magazine, but I'm ordering the old Moody's. Uh, You've got a strange guy here. <laughs> well, when you were uh, working in New York, uh, you were attracted to one of the companies that Ben Graham was involved with, which was Geico. Absolutely. As I understand, you came down and knocked on the door of uh, Geico, and you just started talking with them? And yeah, it, it, was, it was really a lucky day. I, went, I, went, I was at the Columbia University Library, and I looked up Ben in Who's Who in America, and it had a whole bunch of things. But it said, Chairman, Government Employees Insurance Company. So I asked the librarian, uh, how can I learn more about this? I'd never taken any courses in insurance. And he said, well, there's this big best manual. If you read that, you can find out about the company. And there was one page on government employees insurance. So that Saturday, I got on the first train, and I came down to, uh, to Washington, and I went to the headquarters of what was then called government employees insurance. And to my total surprise, the place was locked. I mean, people didn't work, and, and people normally worked on Saturday. People in Washington didn't seem to work on Saturday. So I kept pounding on the door, and finally a janitor came, and I said to the janitor, I said, is there anybody here I can talk to except you? Now, he didn't seem to get offended at that particular introduction, so he said, there's a fellow up on the, on the I think, sixth floor, and uh, he's the only one here, and he was a man named Lorimer Davidson, and Lorimer Davidson changed my life in a big way. He was a wonderful, wonderful man, and uh, uh, he talked with me for maybe four hours on a Saturday and gave me an education like I'd never gotten in school. And so you liked it so much, you eventually bought the whole company, and right? It's one of those things, yeah. <laughs> it, it took a few years. <laughs> so when you were starting your investment partnership, I think you started around 1956 with a partnership. That's correct. Right? And as I understand it, if somebody had put $10,000 in in 1956, and it stayed with you and, and kept uh, stock that they could have gotten when you liquidated some of the partnerships, that 10000 would be worth roughly $500 million today? That's about right. Wow. Yeah. So those people are very grateful to you who did that, right? No. I was grateful to them, though. I mean, they, they were betting on a 25-year-old, you know, who, who looked about 20 and acted about 12. And, and uh, right. so I... You know, uh, and they, actually, they were mostly relatives. I mean, it's my father-in-law and sister, and, and 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 her husband, my aunt. And so your investment partnership started. You started buying companies and uh, buying stocks. And one of the companies you bought was Berkshire Hathaway. And you know, though your company is now very famous, it's named Berkshire Hathaway. That was not one of your best investments, was it? It was really dumb. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I mean, it was. It was what I call a. I used to call Graham's approach on buying very cheap stocks that weren't very good companies uh, cigar butts because you, it would be like walking down the street and finding a cigar butt that there was one puff left in. 
And it didn't cost anything, and it was kind of disgusting, right. but it didn't cost anything. So, but I thought Berkshire Hathaway was that kind of a company. And it wasn't much of a puff right, either. Right. <laughs> well, so, you know, your company is named Berkshire Hathaway. You've sold that company many years ago. Did you ever think of changing the name? No, no. Uh, I, don't, I don't do much of that. <laughs> okay. So when you started, originally you were buying stocks, you picked stocks, but then you started buying whole companies. Was yeah. that a different skill set? And how did you learn to buy and operate these companies? Well, when I buy 100 shares of XYZ company, I, I look at it as buying the whole company. Uh, and so I've always looked at buying stocks as buying businesses. So it really wasn't a different situation. Now, I, I couldn't resell it, and I couldn't, uh, if I owned the stock, I couldn't change managements, which I could if I owned the whole company. But it was basically the same approach. I'm a better investor because I'm a, a business person, and I'm a better business person because I'm an investor. They cross over. But well, today, Berkshire Hathaway has how many different companies that are part of the... Uh, the, the kind of about 75, but some of those own more companies. So, it, so you have 75 companies, you have about... Uh, 270,000 employees. 270,000 employees. How do you manage all that? You have a very small office. How many people do you have in your office managing all this? Well, we're now up to 24. Oh, we're, we're on one floor. We're never going to leave one floor. I, I tell them they're going to hire all the people they want, but we're not going to leave one floor. So if they want people sitting on their lap, go to it, you know. <laughs> so well, you, do you sit in your office during the day looking at new ideas for companies? Is that how you spend I, your I, time? I, I like to read a lot. So I read, a lot, I read newspapers and I read all kinds of financial information. And, and basically, I'm looking for one good idea a year. And do people send you letters over the transom? Did any of those ideas ever work? Uh, occasionally, but not, not very often. But I only need one a year. Okay. We're in June, incidentally, David, if you want to help me out. Okay. I mean. All right. Okay. <laughs> well, we have a couple of companies we like to sell to you, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but you don't pay high prices. But uh, um, so in your office, do you have a computer in your office that you not use? Not in my office, but, but uh, other people in the office have them. Okay. So I know you're not a famous technology person, but do you have an iPad or do you do no. internet things? Oh, I do internet things. Yeah, I, I love the internet. I mean, the internet, it's, it's fascinating to me because uh, it's, it's probably affected my life, you know, as, almost as much as, say, Bill Gates did. I, we have a, when Bill and I appear together, sometimes we, we use the trick question of, aside from email, which one of us is on, is, is, is on the computer more, and the answer is me. Because you play bridge on I the computer. I play bridge on the internet. And right. every, every, every <laughs> night you spend? Yeah, a couple hours a night. And after all these years of doing it, are you a champion? No, no, I'm not even close. <laughs> uh, I, I just have a good time every, you know, it, it, it's the most interesting game I've found. And do people know that they're playing with you over the internet? I use or? the name T-Bone, and that's, it's gotten around that I am T-Bone, yeah. Right. I used to put my age as 103, so right. when I did something dumb, people would say, for a guy 103, he's not bad, but. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you met over the years Bill Gates. How right. did you first meet Bill? What? How that? did you first meet him? I met him in, uh, on July 5th, 1991. Meg Greenfield, who some of the people here probably knew, had a, had a house out in, I don't know, Bainbridge Island out right there in Seattle. And she'd call me in the late 80s and she said, Warren, do I, I love Seattle. Do I have enough money to buy a second place? And I said, Meg, anybody that calls me and asks does have enough. It's the ones that don't call. So she bought this house and she wanted to show it to me then in 1991. So actually, Kay Graham, I, Raleigh Evans, uh, uh, maybe one or two others went out there and, and visited Meg. And then Meg knew the senior Gateses so she called up uh, Bill Sr. and Mary Gates and said, I've got this crew out here, and could we drop down? And Mary said, fine. And then Mary called up Bill and said, uh, Warren Buffett's coming down, and would you like to come down? He said, hell no. Uh, <laughs> what do I have in common with that guy? You know, he, he, he doesn't understand technology. You know, he's, he's, he's hopeless. And Mary was very determined, and she said, you know, you're going to come, Bill. And so they negotiated a while, and finally they got down to where he said he'd come down for, I don't know, an hour and 27 minutes right. or some other thing. And, and he came down, and we hit it off, and we were still talking 10 hours later, and we became good friends. But he never convinced you to buy Microsoft stock or buy technology companies? He didn't, he didn't try to. He tried to get me to use a computer. Did and, that work? Uh, uh, eventually. Uh, uh, when I learned I could play bridge on it, I got interested. <laughs> I, thought, I still don't understand what happens with it, though. Well, I, I mean, thought he originally said, I'll 
get the most beautiful woman did, working at Microsoft and come and install that's it. That's what he did, but, but, but he was engaged to her, so okay. <laughs> Melinda, <laughs> so it didn't work. So as you got to know Bill better, did he influence your views on how to uh, make investments or influence your views on philanthropy? I wouldn't say too much. We, we, we have a group of maybe 50 people that started getting together in 1968. We meet every other year. Don Graham was here tonight as, 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 as the Buffett you know, group. Yeah, and, and, and at, that, at those meetings, we would talk about various subjects, and, and philanthropy was an important subject. So uh, I think it was maybe in 1993 or something like that, we had a meeting. Uh, I think it was in Ireland at that time, and, and I actually brought along the gospel of wealth for everybody to read, we discussed it then. But so our thinking sort of evolved uh, together in a way. But have you um, ever regretted not getting involved in giving away money earlier in your life? Or you've done no, it? My, my wife regretted that. She thought I should, she liked the idea of giving away. We both agreed on giving away all the money. I mean, it, it, uh, once we had everything we wanted, and we've had everything we wanted. I mean, it, it, it uh, you know, and the surplus wealth I have has no utility to me. It has all kinds of utility to the rest of the world if used properly. Right. So uh, we agreed on that early. She would have liked the idea of giving away more of it earlier, and I, I felt that I was going to be a better compounding machine than, than, than most places, and that there would be a whole lot more to give away later on. So I told her, I'll pile it up and you unpile it. You know. okay. All right. Now, your father was a very conservative Republican congressman, right. and you were probably a liberal Democrat. Is that a fair? Well, yeah, I would, but I was, I was Always very a, conservative back. You were conservative yeah. or when he was alive, right. and right. then you later moved further to the left, and would you fair, it's, it's fair to say you're a liberal Democrat now, or? Yeah, but I'm not a card-carrying Democrat. I support okay. certain Republicans, okay. and I have, and, and actually this year I gave some money to a Republican congressman. And uh, you've become famous recently in Washington for, among other things, the Buffett rule, which says that uh, people, uh, I guess, tax rates should be at least as high as their secretaries. Yeah, uh, in terms of the aggregate of payroll and, and, and income taxes. I, I couldn't get a disease named after me, so I had to settle right. for a tax. I mean. <laughs> and have any of your friends suggested that you compensate your secretary uh, in capital gains kind of thing so she could pay a lower rate? She's been suggesting that lately, right. yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's always on the phone with some tax advisor now. now the, the interesting thing is people have speculated about how much money she made, but the tax rate actually above $106,000 for most people goes down if you take the aggregate of payroll and income taxes because the, the payroll tax is the most regressive of all and quits at that point. And uh, so actually between say 106 and 200, in most cases the rate would go down. Well, your financial acumen is pretty well known. So we now have in our country $15.5 trillion of debt in our federal government and one trillion a year or so adding up. Um, what would you do if you were able to wave a wand and try to fix our debt problem or deficit problem? Well, I, I think I would do what everybody in this room could do. Uh, I mean, if, if you ask everybody here how much the federal government should be raising annually or, or in aggregate over the next 10 years, the answers would come in somewhere between 18 and a half and 19 and a half percent, which is close to what's been the situation since World War II. If you ask them how much the government should be spending, they'd probably come in at 21%, someone would come in at 20 and a half or 21 and a half. There's, and incidentally, you can have a two percentage point deficit relative to GDP, and, and the debt to GDP will not grow. I mean, it, 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 in fact, it probably will shrink it just a touch. So you can have a couple percent deficits on average. And I would take the plan that 90% of the people here would come up with to get to that 19% of revenue and or to get to 21%. It can be Simpson Bowles, it can be a bunch of different things. And no one's gonna agree 100% on every point. But we do, I think we do agree on the fact that we probably should be raising 18.5 to 19% and we should be spending 21 or thereabouts. And that means, it means getting more from taxes and it means cutting expenditures. And the problem is that you know, the, the Democrats don't wanna talk about what expenditures they would cut, and the, and the Republicans don't want to talk about increasing revenues. So, would you would be in favor of increasing the the uh, capital gains tax, or no? Yeah, I would. I, I would be in favor of that. But but we could come to. We're raising, we'll say, you know, two point four, two point five trillion now. We have to raise, you know, probably three or four hundred billion more than that. And 
That can be done. I mean, we've done it straight right. through. I mean, and I've, I've operated under all kinds of tax rates, including 39.6% on capital gains. And the country has grown under all these circumstances. Our country works. Uh, but somebody has to step up and say where it comes from. And it won't come from, just talking about reform doesn't solve anything on either the expenditure side right. or the revenue side. I mean, you've got to get specific about it. And, and like I said, I would, I'll bet if everybody in this room designed a plan, I could sign on to 90% of them. And uh, today, uh, the economy in the United States is thought to be growing about 2.5% a year. Do you agree with that? Do you think there's any chance of a recession in the near term? I think it's very low unless, unless events in Europe develop in some way that, that spill over here big time. Uh, but incidentally, if the economy grows 2% a year and population grows 1% a year, that means every, each generation is living 20% better than the generation before, and it means in a century, people are living three times as well as they lived at the start of the century. So, right. I mean, our, our, our rates of gain in the way people live has, has been dramatic. In my lifetime, I was born in 1930, there's six times the real GDP per capita as right. when I was born. Six times in one person's lifetime. We have a system that works. Uh, I mean, and it'll keep working. You know, it may not work at six times for the next 80 years, but it'll work, it'll be two and a half times or three right. times. Now, are you worried about the euro going away? Do you think Europe would allow the euro to go away, or? That's the big question. I mean, uh, you know, uh, well, Lincoln said that, you know, a uh, house divided cannot stand and half slave, half free wouldn't work, and we've got a system where it's, they're half in and half out. I mean, they're in on a cr common currency, and they're not in, on common fiscal policy or common culture or common labor practices. And that house will fall, but that doesn't mean it has to, and that, it, it means that they have to they have to reconcile some of these things. It, it can't be half slave, half free. Now, you invest most of your money, I guess, in the United States. Yeah. Have you increasingly been investing outside, particularly in the emerging markets, or you're not as comfortable investing in the emerging I'm, markets? I'm, I'm comfortable any place I understand the business well, and to some extent the rules that they operate in, and where I've got the right management. And so I, we will buy a business you know, in any one of 40 countries tomorrow if it's the right kind of business, uh, but most businesses I hear about are in the United States. They think of Berkshire here. We're, not, we're on the radar screen here to a right. greater extent than around the world. So I understand that somebody from Israel sent you a letter right. uh, over the transom, a one and a half page letter, and you ultimately bought that company that person was talking about for four plus billion? Was well, that we, we bought 80% of it for four billion, and, and he wanted me to go see it. He told me what a wonderful place plan he had and everything, and I said, I'm not gonna go see, you know, I don't go to, I don't go to Iowa, right. you know, as far as that's concerned. <laughs> and, and he said, no, that, he said, you've never seen a plan like this. And I said, you know, Aton, I said, you know, I love your business, I love you, you know, I'll give you four billion dollars, but I'm not gonna, I'm not going to go to, you know, I gotta start crossing oceans or anything right. crazy like that. <laughs> so he said, well, if you buy the biz business, will you come? And I said, yes. So we bought the business, and then I went to Israel, and it was everything he said, and he was very pleased. And I said, yeah, I said, if I'd seen this thing, I'd have paid you more money. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I don't go visit businesses. <laughs> so what about China? Do you invest much there? you go to China very we've much? Had, we've had a, two big investments. I was sitting in 2002 or 2003 reading the report of PetroChina. And it was fortunately it was in English. And I uh, put about $500 million into PetroChina. The government of China owned about 90% of it. We owned 1.3%, so between the two of us, we controlled the company. Uh, uh, the, uh, and we made quite a bit of money out of that. It was a very, very cheap company. I mean, it was one of the huge oil companies in the world, and the whole company was selling for $35 billion in the market, and that was ridiculous. Now, one of your most famous investments is Coca-Cola. You bought yeah. it relatively mm. cheaply. It's very good for point. you, everybody. And, um, now, <laughs> When you I don't were, care whether you drink it, just pour it on your neighbor, but open the can. <laughs> now, when you were a young boy, you, you were addicted, I was told, to Pepsi. How did you switch to Coke? Well, I, I would like to say, of course, that I, I just finally grew up and understood. When I was a kid, Pepsi was 12 ounces for a nickel, and Coke was six and a half ounces for a nickel. And if you have any insights into my personality, you'll know which I bought. <laughs> So of the investments you've made over the years at Berkshire Hathaway, which one would you say was the single best investment? Is there one that you really are most proud of? Well, the, the, the one I'm probably the most emotionally attached to is Geico because of a, a, a bunch of reasons, but it goes back at, at, to a day in January of 1951, a Saturday. And, and that, 
what Norma Davidson did for me changed my life. And he didn't have to do it. I mean, I walked in there as some 20-year-old kid on a, on a Saturday, and he, he spent four hours educating me. And then he became a friend for life. And then subsequent people are Jack Byrne and, and Tony Nicely, who's here tonight. I mean, it's, it's, it's just been a wonderful association, whether we made any money or not. But, we, but we've done pretty well on the investment, too. But it, beyond that, it, it, it has a special meaning to me. Are there investments that you really wish you had never done? What's your worst investment? I made a lot of terrible deals. Uh, and the worst, it's, it's hard to, uh, probably the worst deal will be one I make in the future, but the, uh, the current title, I, I, I bought a company, and, and, and incidentally, I did it. I mean, we do not have uh, PowerPoints around or people explaining this stuff to me. I just go out and do them. And we, we bought a company uh, called Dexter Shoe. George Mitchell's here tonight. He knows the company. And we paid $400 million for it, uh, which went to zero, but we paid $400 million in stock. And the stock we gave up is probably worth maybe three or four billion today. So whenever Berkshire oh. goes down, I feel better about that deal. Oh. I mean, my <laughs> <laughs> what about the deals you passed on? You famously passed on Intel when it was getting started, I thought. And other yeah, I knew Bob, Bob Noyce pretty well. And we bought it. We bought the converts when they were private, or just uh, because of Bob. We bought them at Grinnell College. And, and the endowment of Grinnell College went from $8 million to a, to a billion dollars in about 12 or 14 years. So, and Intel, Intel was a help on that. But I, you know, in the end, uh, I don't worry about things I don't understand. I mean, uh, I think it was Tom Watson Sr. said, I'm no genius but I'm smart in spots and I stay around those spots, right. you know. And that, uh, 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 there's a lot to that. And knowing your circle of competence is where that perimeter is, right. is enormously important. And, you know, the fact that there are all, there's all kinds of things I can't do. And there's plenty of companies I can't analyze, but I don't have to worry about that. Well, of all the companies you bought, maybe the one that bought you, brought you the most trouble was Salomon. When you bought it, at one point it was almost, uh, <laughs> in effect, put in the bankruptcy and you had to go and run the company. Was that the most difficult experience you had at Berkshire Hathaway? I would say that probably was, yeah. That was, I was there as CEO for nine months and four days, and it was 20 years ago, and I think I remember every day of it. <laughs> so um, today, when you have all these managers running your 75 different companies, do they call you every day and say, I got this problem or that problem, or how no. often do you no. talk to them? No, if they need to call me, they're in trouble. <laughs> they, I mean, I, I, we buy businesses where the managers come with them, and, and uh, uh, there are some managers that I don't talk to once a year, and there's one I talk to almost every day. Uh, but uh, after the one that I talk to almost every day, I would say the, the next most, the highest frequency would be maybe once a week. Uh, but they always call me, I don't call them. Now, when you want to make an investment, um, you have a board of directors. Do you ever ask them? Uh, I've heard that you will buy a railroad for 20 some billion and not tell your board of directors. I told a few of them. Few of them. Okay. <laughs> that was an exception uh, I, that I told them, and not that I. <laughs> the, no, the uh, part of part of why we're able to make deals is because we we can act fast. They know we have the money. They know we'll do the deal. We closed on October sixth, two thousand eight, on a six and a half billion dollar investment in Wrigley in, in conjunction with Mars, and. They knew we would have the six and a half billion, and that we would close on that day. People weren't closing on anything, and so it's 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 a real advantage to be able to pull the trigger. And 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 one and if we have to go through lots of presentations and everything, I mean, I, I've been on 19 corporate boards, and you know, every deal works on the PowerPoint, you know, and and uh, so it, it 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 it's a show and tell type thing, and I don't I don't really participate in it. So. Um recently came out in court uh, discussion that uh, in the insider trading thing that's going on relating to investment you had made in Goldman. Right. Um, it came out that you had set the deal and you told the investment banker this is the deal and they had to get back to you but you said don't call for a few hours because you're going to Dairy Queen right. with your grandchildren. Is that right? You, that's true. You didn't want to be disturbed on a deal? Well, I just, I, I knew what I would do and I told them what I would do and if they wanted to do it fine if they didn't want to do it fine. I mean, I, we, we, we don't really negotiate at, at, at Berkshire. It's just, I don't have enough time, you know, to spend the rest of my life, you know, negotiating with people. So I tell them what I'll do. And, right. and if it works, fine. If it doesn't work, fine. Then. Now, um, famously, people wonder who will be your successor. And I wonder if tonight you wanted to give us any 
insights into that. Well, I have left the directors a Ouija board, and I plan to keep in contact with them. Right. Right. <laughs> I don't want to disappoint you, but you're not on the short list, David. <laughs> <laughs> Um, can I be on the long list? <laughs> so um, we're 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 in perfect shape for it, though. I will say that we we've got we've got successors that that are, in most ways are better than I am. But you expect that Berkshire will be around for 20, 30, 40 years forever. as a big. Uh, it's 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 built to be forever. It, it it has a special culture. It has directors who are committed to that. It has managers. It would. We have an organization that would reject anybody that tried to tamper with that culture. And, and I think it, it is special and it can stay special. So today, having achieved all that you have achieved, you've got the admiration of virtually everybody in the world for what you've done. What kind of motivates you to keep going? Uh, what, what are your aspirations over the next five years or so? I'm having the time of my life. I mean, I get to do every day exactly what I like to do with people who I love and who seem to like me pretty well. And, and it doesn't get any better than that. I, I tell the students that come to see me, and I have 48 universities come out every year, I tell the students, take the job you would take if you didn't need a job. And I've got the job that I, I, would, I don't need a job, and I've, I've got that job. Now, you've give, you're giving away 99% of your wealth. You have three children, uh, seven grandchildren, and nine great-grandchildren. That's it. And any of them ever say, maybe you could leave some of that to me, or they never? <laughs> well, I'm leaving some of it to them. Uh, and one of the things I do is that I don't write a will very often, but when I, when I write a will, I give it to my children first before I sign it. They all read it. They're, they're the executors. Uh, right. And I want them, I want two things. I want them to understand exactly what's in it, and secondly, I want them to agree with it. I mean, and if they don't, I want them to talk it out now and we'll figure out what makes sense. And so every, I don't know, five or six years or seven years, whenever I do this, they read it, and sometimes there is something that they don't understand in terms of exactly what their duties might be or something of the sort. And then in terms of equating, I've got one son that likes a farm, I've got a farm that he'll get, I've got another daughter that likes the particular house, and I've got these various ways of equating that and percentages and all right. of that, and, and uh, in the end, I think they feel very, very lucky in life. So the average person who doesn't have your investment skills and they want to not lose their money, they, would you recommend that they play the stock market, they buy mutual funds? What do you recommend to the average investor? Well, playing the stock market, uh, no, playing is a, not a word I would choose. Uh, the, I, I would recommend that they put a similar sum, and maybe they'd be earning more as they went along, but, but save something every month and just and, and basically put it in an index fund. Right. They are not in a position to make judgments on stocks themselves. They're not in the game any more than I'm, you know, right. I, can, I can prescribe in medicine or something of the sort. They will get a good result. The, the American economy has done wonderfully. I mean, if you take the 20th century, the Dow started at 66 and it ended at 11,400. Right. Now think of that. How could anybody get a bad result in investing starting at 66 and 11,400? But a lot of people do because they jump in at the wrong time or they right. think they know this stock versus that stock. But the average person should just consistently buy equities, which to me are by far the most attractive uh, investment choice around, and they and put it in, and if they do that for 20 or 30 years, they'll do very well. But you, you don't subscribe to the efficient market theory that says that basically you can't beat the stock market? You, you Subscribe to that theory that you can't, or you? Well, if I'd subscribe to that theory, right. I, I, I'd still be delivering papers. Right. <laughs> yeah. no, right. no, no, I, I think, I think, I, oh, I, 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 I don't think there's any question that certain people who evaluate stocks as businesses can make intelligent decisions about businesses, which will enable them to do very well in, in the securities market. But I don't think somebody that is listening, you know, to a. a, a a TV channel tell them what to do, or somebody right. you know, jumping around with astronics, or, or even some salesperson who's getting paid more right. money for selling them something and getting them to change tomorrow uh, is, is the key to it. Now, you've, you gave away, or committed to give away, the bulk of your money to uh, a foundation set up by other people. Why did you choose not to just have the money go to a foundation named after you that presumably you would control? And how did that idea come about? Well, originally, I'd, I'd actually planned, I, I thought my first wife would outlive me and that she would 
give away the money. So it, it would have gone to a foundation that she ran. But the idea was to get the money spent. And you say it's run by other people, but it, you know, if, if you set up the Ford Foundation or right. you set up the Carnegie Foundation, they're being run by other people. It's just that the Carnegie didn't know who they would be or, or Henry Ford didn't know who they'd be. So you, they are going to be run by other people if they extend beyond your lifetime. And I, uh, I picked people that I had <laughs> enormous confidence in the fact that they had a similar judgment about where money should go and, and, and where I thought they would do a first-class job of administering it. And then, I mean, in the case of the Gates Foundation, I get people that are putting up their own money big time who are very able people who are working full-time at it themselves who aren't charging me anything. And, and I've got these foundations that are run by my children that uh, it, it's been wonderful for them. Uh, and they each have a separate foundation so that they can follow their own interests and not have to sort of lo you know, roll logs as to who right. votes for this one or that one. And it's all worked out perfectly. And what was Bill Gates' reaction when you called him and said, guess what, I'm giving you $50 billion eventually? I, I think he said, what? <laughs> no, I shouldn't joke about this. No, the, I, I don't remember exactly what he said, but I think he was surprised. <laughs> okay. And did he suggest you put your name on the foundation as well? No, I, 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 I don't want my name on anything. I, I, my, my, you can, there are all kinds of people that do want their names on it. So if you can sell it to some other guy, why should you give, give it to me where you don't get anything out of it? You know? <laughs> okay, I understand. So... Um, <laughs> As you go forward now, are there certain things that you would like to accomplish uh, beyond what you've accomplished? Are there certain social problems you'd like to see being solved or economic problems? Or is your goal mostly to keep your company doing well and give away the money? Well, in terms of personally, sure. I'd like to, I'd like to, I, I want Berkshire. I mean, that, that, that is my painting in life. I've been painting it all my life virtually and I want to keep painting it and have it become even uh, more of what it already is. And, and so. That's what I love. I mean, anything, that, anything that works positively for Berkshire in terms of adding better businesses, you know, having wonderful managers around, anything makes them be in a position to get their full potential of, of from their companies. I love, and I'll do that as long as I can. I like the idea that the, the, the basically the fruits of that, you know, will be used by some very intelligent people to improve the lot of a whole bunch of people who didn't get the lucky straw in life like I got. And how old were you when you realized you were much better than other people in picking stocks and, and making these kind of investments? Did you realize that as a young person, or did it take much longer before you realized you were much better than everybody else? It, it sounds obnoxious, but I thought I was going to be pretty good. <laughs> I, I went through this period at, at Wilson, uh, Woodrow Wilson, where I, uh, I, I, was, I was really bad at Alice Deal, but I was kind of working out of it at Woodrow Wilson. And I had the, these teachers that I caused some trouble to, but they did think I knew a lot about stocks. And of course, in those days, teachers put all their money in AT&T. I mean, that was the ultimate right. safe investment. So when I was feeling particularly obnoxious, I, would, I shorted a little AT&T and brought the confirmation, right. showed them to the teachers, made them worry a little. <laughs> but I, no, I, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't love anything as much as I loved investments and, and, and not get fairly good at it. I spent. I read every book in the Omaha Public Library on investments by the time I was 11, and we moved back here. And as soon as I got back here and my dad was in Congress, I said, get everything in the Library of Congress, I want to read it. <laughs> well, well, there's one company in Washington we didn't mention. Uh, you obviously bought Geico, and that's one of your most famous investments, but you made a very famous investment in the Washington Post right. many years ago. What attracted you to the Washington Post, and how long have you held that investment? Well, I, I love the business as such, but when I bought the Washington Post company, uh, this is pretty split. They had about 4.8 million shares outstanding, and the stock got down to 16. But, but thanks to the Nixon challenge to TV station, their TV stations and a few things, and BB Rebozo and the rest, the stock cascaded down from 37. So it, when we bought it, the whole valuation of the, Ameri of the Washington Post company was about $100 million. Now, if you'd asked any reporter at the Washington Post to go out and do a story on what the Washington Post company's constituent businesses were worth, they would have come back and said four or five hundred million. So you were really buying a wonderful business run by wonderful people at 20 cents or thereabouts on the dollar. And, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it's almost a, a classic investment. If you'd asked any of the people who were selling their stock to us, what's the Washington Post company worth, they would have said three or four times what it's selling for. But they sold it because they thought it was going to go down the next day. And they were right for a while. <laughs> but you've owned that now for 30 it's been It's been 29 years. Or, I mean, uh, 39 years. So you are an optimist about the future of our country? It's a cinch.
Yeah, we, we haven't lost the secret sauce. <laughs> I mean, yeah, go back to that. I, I, when I was born in 1930, Dow was 252 on, on the day before. I was born on a Saturday. Friday was 252. That was the high for the year. It was going to go down to 42. I, I, there's no connection in this, folks. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> but, you know, if I'd seen that, uh, my, dad, my dad was going to lose his job, and, and, and he worked in a bank, and, they were, and he had all his money in that bank, and it closed, and he had no money to pay his mortgage or anything. That was going to happen within a year. If you'd seen that, you said, this, you know, go back. It'd be like the old Woody Allen movie, you know, just don't, don't even come out. And look at what has happened since that time. I mean, you know, we went through... A terrible war, we went through a terrible depression, we went through 25% unemployment, we went through thousands of banks closing, six for one, you know. We're not smarter than the people in 1930. We don't work harder than the people in 1930. We've just got a system that works. That's been working, you know, since, since 1776, and it'll keep working. So, oh, any regrets in life? Not really, no. And today you are um, somebody who, very close to the President of the United States, if he asked you to <laughs> come in and serve as an advisor, would you do that? Or? Well, it won't happen. <laughs> if, if, he, if he wants to ask me anything, I'll, I'll certainly be, I'd, I'd always be glad to help, but I, that would be true of any president or any circumstances. And today, Berkshire Hathaway, is that a buy at this price? Well, the businesses it owns are worth more than the market price, but that's true of other businesses too. Well, what I'd like to do is, uh, on behalf of everybody here, thank you for an extraordinary tour de force of uh, your explanations of things. And thank you very much for coming this evening. And uh, I think everybody's had an enjoyable evening. I know I certainly did. And I want to thank you on behalf of everybody uh, here and all America for what you've done and for your philanthropy and for your confidence in America. And on behalf of uh, our, the Washington Economic Club and uh, and our, our, everybody here, I'll give you a few gifts if I could. You may get on that short list of entry this uh, way. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, this um, is a Woodrow Wilson um, high school jacket we've had made up for you. Go Tigers! <laughs> And um, we have here um, a copy of the original map of the District of That's Columbia it. we'd like to give to you uh, as a gift from the club. And um, I'd like to give you as a personal gift a um, copy of the Declaration of Independence. When we talked about this uh, appearance, um, you were at the archives, and I think you said you hadn't been there before. It was marvelous. Never been there, and um, I cornered you, and you said you weren't sure you would, what you had agreed to, but you agreed that you would do this, and I thank you for honoring your commitment to come. And this says, it's inscribed to you, and it says, Warren Buffett, a rare modern man with the essential traits of our founding fathers, great wisdom, courage, and leadership, and also great wealth. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Appreciate it. Thanks.